Thank you so much, sir. You may be seated. If, if you can, sit. Sit. If you can. This is what you just say, go in this dynamite. Nothing else to say. Our next and final speaker at the platform today is Dr. Mensah Otterbill. <laughs> Dr. Mensah Otterbill is the founder and general overseer of the International Central Gospel Church with its extensive network of churches across Ghana, other parts of Africa, Europe, and the United States. He is the chancellor of Central University, Ghana's premier private university. He chairs a number of boards and provides oversight to organizations in diverse industries. Pastor Otterbill has pioneered a number of life-changing social interventions in the areas of healthcare, education, sports, and the provision of social amenities and scholarships for hundreds of underprivileged children over the years. He presents Living Word, an inspirational daily broadcast on radio and television across Ghana, as well as parts of Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. He's the author of several books and publications, including Beyond the Rivers of Ethiopia and the Dominion Mandate. Pastor Otabel and his wife, Joy, live in, Ga in, in Ghana and are parents of four adult children and grandchildren. Please join me as we have the honor of welcoming Dr. Mensa Otabel to the platform, Nigeria. Thank you very much. Kindly be seated. It's a great honor. Uh, Pastor Podju, thank you so much for this honor and for this platform that you have erected uh, for very serious thought and uh, very serious speakers uh, to present. Uh, I think you're doing something that generations yet to come would one day pinpoint as one of the major factors for Africa's growth and development. Congratulations and thank you so much for what you've done. And uh, I don't know whether it's good to be a last speaker at such a conference because uh, it's just been brilliant. I've been monitoring and uh, listening to all the speakers and the brilliant thoughts and ideas uh, that have been presented. And of course, our illustrious last speaker with a prodigious mind on Africa and speaking so intelligently and eloquently about where we are, where we ought to be, uh, and where, how we're going to get there. Uh, and so I just feel as a pastor that my last job is just to say amen and, and just sit down because all the ideas have been put out. So I want to celebrate all the speakers uh, for their brilliance. And, and thank you so much. Um, it's just so hopeful and so, uh, so exciting to be an African at this time and, and to know that we have men and women who have applied their minds, their spirit uh, to some of the complex issues facing us as a nation, uh, as a continent, and of course, uh, Nigeria being the host as a nation. And a belated happy birthday to Nigeria. Happy Independence Day. Uh, 63 years uh, is long uh, in, in some terms, but in terms of national development uh, is not really that long. Uh, and so, as the last speaker said, let's, let's have perspective as we think about where we are and what we want to be. I want to pay tribute to some of the people that were instrumental in developing this nation, fighting for its freedom. Sir Herbert Macaulay, uh, Dr. Namdi Azikwe, <laughs> Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, Sir Ahmed Bello, and so many men and women who lit the flame for Nigeria's independence and fought so hard for what we uh, enjoy today. Uh, these were men and women of spirit, of intellect, of passion, and compassion. And in addition to 
your own great heroes. Uh, we add the sons and daughters of our continent. And I also pay tribute to the pioneering leaders of the African Decolonization Project. Kwame Nkrumah, Hale Selassie, Ahmed Sekuturi, Modibo Keita, Herbert Maga, Jomo Kenyatta, Julius Nerere, Kenneth Kawunda, Leopold Seda Sengo, Felix Hufwe Buanyi, Patrice Lumumba, Amilka Cabral, Serete Kama, Agostino Nete, Samora Michelle, Sam Nujoma, Robert Mugabe, Nelson Mandela, and many of these individuals with their hopes, with their struggles, with their flaws and weaknesses and their idealism, they fought a battle for each one of us. And as a people, sometimes we do very little to honor their memory and we tend to forget the sacrifices uh, they have made. But as we have heard today from one of the speakers, these men and women fought formidable odds to give us freedom, uh, and, and we must build on their courage, and we must not be deterred simply by a tweet or a hashtag, uh, because these were fighting some major battles uh, uh, at all levels, intellectually and sometimes in physical uh, engagement. And, and certainly these men and women uh, who led us to political independence were not perfect. As human beings, they had their weaknesses and some of them made some terrible choices later on in life and, uh, and uh, some of the major fault lines of weaknesses in our society uh, were instigated by some of them. Uh, but we must not look only at their mistakes and throw away the value that they contributed to us. I believe that in a sense they reflect the thoughts of the psalmist in Psalm 120 verse 7, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Uh, the psalmist tells us that sometimes our intentions and our actions conflict. Uh, we have good intentions, we want to see good things happen, and then in the end we do things that are opposite our intended uh, objectives. So for better, for worse, uh, we are standing where they left us and we, they are the, uh, the, the people who have given us what we have and that is the hand uh, we have been dealt and that is the game we have to play. We cannot wish that other leaders were our leaders. We can only work with what we have inherited. And today on this platform, we thank God that a Christian organization, a church, uh, is considering some of these serious ideas uh, that make for the building of society. And once again, thank you, Pastor, uh, for going beyond the church and, and erecting this public area of discourse. The era that ended the last century, from the 90s, uh, Africa seemed to be a very hopeful place. Uh, gradually, we were ending uh, some of the conflicts on our continent. Military regimes were giving place to civilian regimes. We started writing constitutions and started holding elections and erecting governments with term limits. And we all assumed that uh, change had come. The world was so excited and enthused about what was happening on our continent. Uh, we, we, there were raving remarks about Africa rising. And then in the last few years, in the last three years, it looks like uh, there have been major setbacks. And um, nation after nation, we are seeing uh, coup d'etats making a comeback. And the sobering reality is uh, as our last speaker said, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. The project, the endeavor to build a nation is not always straightforward. Uh, and sometimes you take one step forward uh, and take another backwards. But hopefully the next time you take two forward and one backward. And, and make slow progress, uh, but in a determined fashion. As most of you uh, would know, um, uh, from the 1960s, uh, when we started the era of coup d'etats, Nigeria, uh, whether thankfully or regretfully, started the process for us. 
so, so we're, we're hoping that uh, Nigeria, finding it right, gets it right for the rest of Africa. Uh, because the magnetic pull, the gravitational pull of Nigeria over Africa is enormous. And, and what happens here has serious repercussions for the rest of our continent. And we pray for Nigeria. We are very hopeful and, uh, and, uh, and very, uh, very committed to the project of seeing Nigeria uh, succeed. Having listened to most of the leaders, uh, you know, sometimes we hear people talk so eloquently about our problems and so eloquently about our solutions, and we, we sort of wonder, why is that one not the president? Why is that not one not leading the country? But, you know, uh, sometimes it's not as easy as that. It's not so much about the person, but also about the system that a person uh, operates in. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his time who were ignoring the core values of the law. And this is what Jesus said to them. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Jesus, in this statement, says that some things are more important than other things. Some are weightier than other things. And he talked about faith as weighty, and mercy as weighty, and justice as weighty. Now, for us Christians, and I'm speaking this way because this is in a church setting, for us Christians, faith is always weighty. Um, it, it is what brings us into salvation. It is faith that makes us born again and, 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 and gives us new life in Christ Jesus. And most of us use faith also to pray for the things we need. But the faith Jesus is talking about here is not just about what happens inside your heart, but it's talking about faithfulness towards God and his word and his law. And human beings have a way sometimes of making the things of God, especially Christians, more personal than uh, public. There is a personal faith which brings us salvation, but there must be a public faith that helps us to interact with our society and our community. That means that after Christ has saved you in your heart, you must go out to your community and try to transform it and bring salvation to the society. So there is a personal faith, but there has to be a public faith as well. There is a personal mercy, but there has to be a, pers a public mercy as well. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, a Christian himself, a reverend minister, and a civil rights leader had this to say about Christianity. He says there is something wrong with any church that limits the gospel to talking about heaven over yonder. There is something wrong with any minister who becomes so otherworldly in his orientation that he forgets about what is happening now. There is something wrong with any church that is so absorbed in the hereafter that it forgets the here, unquote. And there is truth to that statement, that our faith must not only apply to our lives as individuals, there has to be a public interface. And people are usually uncomfortable with Christianity when it goes beyond the personal into the public. When the Christianity is personal, People are happy because the Christians are showing good character and living good lives. But when Christianity becomes public, our people get very nervous. They like it when the Christians confine themselves to spiritual matters. But when Christianity starts getting into society, there is nervousness. And this brings to mind the story of a church group which lived at the intersection of a very dangerous highway. There were many accidents and in injuries on the road, so the church decided to start an ambulance service. 
And uh, when they started the ambulance service, everybody was happy with the church. Praise was heaped on the church because it was caring for the needy. It was caring for the sick. It was caring for the suffering. And they did it for a very long time and, and got a lot of praise. Then one day, someone in the church asked, why don't we demand for something to be done about the road so as to present, uh, prevent the accident? And immediately the church raised the question about what was wrong with the road system. The public officials got off offended. And the church was castigated for being too political. They wanted the church to solve the problems of the people without questioning the source of the problem. When we give food to the poor, we are called saints. When we ask why the poor have no food, we are called politicians. To paraphrase Dom Helder Camara. When we pray for the peace of the nation during elections, we are called men of God. When we demand for integrity from our leaders, we are called hypocrites. Politicians always want the prayer of the church, but not the wisdom of the church. They desire to limit the contribution of the church at important gatherings to saying the opening prayers and the closing prayer. And any time we stray from this regimen, we get smacked for wandering. And that is why this platform is so significant because we're not just doing opening prayer and closing prayer here. We're not just praying about the problems of Nigeria or the problems of Africa. We are asking why. And what ought to be done. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus, our Lord, spoke about how to create and contain change. In response to a question as to why his disciples did, not, did things differently from the old traditional system, Jesus answered, No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So in that response, Jesus implied that internal change is not enough. That in addition to having internal change, there was the need for external structural support for real transformation to take place. Simply put, it is not enough to get people saved in church without seeking the transformation of the society in which the people of the church live. It's not enough to exhort people to be good, hardworking, and disciplined. In addition, we must urge for the right structures that ensure good behavior. National development is both personal and public. It's not just about personal change. It's also about public systems. We can talk about people being greedy and people being irresponsible. But I have seen people who seem greedy, people who seem irresponsible, live in well-organized and structured societies. And all of a sudden, they forget to be greedy and they forget to be irresponsible. The same person who sadly uh, would urinate, unfortunately, publicly in the streets of Lagos will not dare do that in London, in the streets of London. Not because the edge is not there or he doesn't have the equipment to do so. Everything is present. But he is restrained simply because he is an, in an external system that imposes good behavior on him. One of the biggest struggles we have in Africa is that we are hoping for the citizens to change, but the system to ensure rightness is not ensured. I am reminded of God and his dealings with the children of Israel. And, you know, many times I've said to people that you just have to pray God is not your president. You just have to pray. Because if God is your president, 
you will be so uncomfortable with life. So how does God behave as president of a nation? Well, check Israel when he was president. Before they had a king, he ruled them. And how did he rule them? Did, yes, he gave them manna. He, he, he had a good social system, a good welfare system. He gave them electricity by day and air conditioning by night. He provided support. He provided the water system worked. He gave them water from a rock. And so in terms of their well-being, he supported them. But he also wanted them to live by laws. And the first thing God did for Israel after he delivered them, if you remember your Bible well, when, when the people were delivered, they went into praise and worship. Miriam and Moses sang songs and they all rejoiced because they've come out of the Red Sea. But that was not God's plan really. God says, you can have your praise and worship. I'm taking you to Mount Sinai. And when they got to Mount Sinai, there was no praise and worship. There was law. And God was so terrifying. And the atmosphere was so dominating that the people did not want to be in the presence of God. Because God understood that to lead a people who have been in bondage and in slavery for 400 years, you have to bring them into a structured environment. And the first thing he did was to give them laws. And not only did he give them laws, but he also had stern reprimands for when you disobey the law. And when people did the listing, he knocked them off. He knocked them off so much that they had to learn to live a structured life. That is God leading a nation. If God was president of Nigeria, most of us would not survive. You did your stuff on the wall, you were gone. You did your stuff in the bush, you were gone. He will take you out until people understood that a nation does not thrive with self-expression alone. It also thrives with a regulated, moderated behavior. And that comes with the law. We've talked a lot today about uh, the African situation and um, I don't want to add to all the things that I have been spoken, I have them in my notes. But one of the key factors, in my opinion, and I would want some of our speakers to give serious thought to it. In my opinion, one of the key factors that has transformed any nation whatsoever from a low status to a better status is discipline. That's it. I had a politician ask me, what is the most important thing we must do for our nation to thrive? And I said, law and order. Where did I learn it from? God. The first thing he did for Israel, law and order. Enforceable, robust law. That's what changed Singapore. We can talk about vision and everything. A disorderly people with a vision will be disorderly still. When you read Lee Kuan Yew's book, he will tell you it was law and order. That was the prime level they started with. People had to, be, to live sanitary lives. You don't keep pigs in your home. They, he had to, they had to stop spitting in public. All of that, he had to force them into a structured world. And that's why you go to Singapore now and chew gum and drop it. Your life is on the line. Now, we praise these nations, but we living under those systems are not as simple as we wish it would be. We're seeing what is happening in Rwanda. What is this main factor of, of transformation? It's not the vision. Everybody has a vision. Everybody has plans. You've had plans. We had one. 
We had vision 2020 and it came in 2020, we saw nothing. The, the, the missing ingredient is, to, is that we are not able to enforce the laws of our nations. We're not able to bring people to respect the laws of the land. And it starts in very basic ways. It started in Singapore. It started in Dubai. It started in, in all the Asian countries. Just check every country. The first primal mover for social transformation is sanitation. Cleanliness. Clean environments. People not making rubbish. Because if people learn not to make rubbish at home, they will not make rubbish in government. If there is sanitation, there is law at the private level, it will be in the public level. So my contribution to all the conversation that we've had is the prime mover of social change is discipline. A disciplined society. It's as simple as that. Don't urinate in the, in the streets. Don't park anyhow. When you, 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 you drink water from that, you don't drop it in the street. When you drop it, you'll be arrested and charged. If we get to that level of responsibility, people take responsibility for themselves. And if it is done without favoritism, and the Lord applies equally to everybody, there will be social transformation. Is it going to be easy? No. Because we are used to lawlessness so much that lawlessness is our norm, is our standard. Is it going to be easy for me? No. When I'm driving in the traffic and it's jammed, I want to go by the sleeve and try to get there early. But if I'm arrested a couple of times, I'll stay in the line and, 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 and respect the process. If we allow people to break the law, we can have visions, we can have great people. Nothing will be done. Was it you who asked that how come uh, the people uh, in the church seem to get it right in the church? Somebody is a deacon or is running it well in the church. But in the public space, they are not doing too well. It's environment. It's environment. The, the easy thing with the church is that we already have laws from the Bible. And so, thou shalt not do, thou shalt not do, thou shalt not do. And when people do, we know how to separate them and, and respect the law. And you would find that the most rigid to obey the law is the most progressive. The one who is more relaxed and liberal with obeying the law doesn't make much progress. If we're going to make progress, the law has to be respected. And each one of us, lawbreakers, must get ready to a regime of law-abiding people. And that, I believe, is that which is the missing factor throughout all of Africa. In the nations that he mentioned, you go to Botswana, there is severe law in Botswana. In Rwanda, in Mauritius, you go to every country, every country that has made progress from third world to first world. The common denominator is law and order. Every country that is struggling and not making any progress, the common denominator, lack of law and order. It is what God established in the book of Genesis. When the earth is without form, darkness is upon the face of the deep, total chaos. God himself solved that problem by bringing law and order, separating the waters from the waters, removing the darkness, making sure that everything stayed in the right place. And then 
He created the man. Because God understood the only way to bring progress and development is through law and order. In addition to all the things we've talked about, about social change, in addition to all the criticisms, the critical factor which I hope we can embrace is to bring law and order to our societies. And we must empower leaders who want to do right. We must empower them. And if they start, as, as difficult as it may seem and feel for us, we must work with them. It was said that one of the brightest times in, uh, in, in Nigeria's life was somewhere, was it in the 70s or so, when um, you had Idi Abon? Somewhere? And yes, and almost everybody I talk about says, those were bright moments. And what was the, 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 the critical thing? Law and order. It wasn't fully applied well. Sometimes they were favorites. But law and order is the underlying factor for social change. And I pray that we will build an Africa of law and order where when we say there is a vision, we have the will and the discipline to get it through and get it done. God bless you.